Good afternoon and good morning to everyone on the line with us. Uh, I want to welcome you to today's webinar on technology strategies to build and mobilize pro bono networks. Um, this webinar is uh, presented by Pro Bono Net in partnership with LSNTAP and the Northwest Justice Project with funding provided by an LSC TIG grant. So before we begin, I want to go over a few logistical things with you. Sorry, that's not the slide. Here we go. Um, uh, we're using the GoToWebinar platform today. Uh, as attendees, you have a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, like the one shown on this, on this slide. You can minimize or maximize your control panel by clicking on the orange arrow at the top left of the panel. Most people's control panel is set to minimize by default, and you'll just see the small toolbar instead. Uh, if you need to expand that, just click on the orange arrow to get it back to the size where you can see all of the tools. If you're joining us today by telephone, uh, please make sure to enter your audio pin. Uh, if you're using VoIP, please make sure that you've selected mic and speakers. Um, and in any case, make sure that you haven't selected one or the other and are using the other. Um, you can switch between the two at any point if you want. Uh, you will lose audio briefly, but it shouldn't take more than a minute to make that switch. Um, we have about 70 people registered. Uh, looks like there's about 40 with us at the moment. Um, so all callers have been automatically placed on mute. Uh, we do really want to hear your questions and feedback throughout this training, though. Um, to communicate with us during the training, you can type a question at any time into the question log. And that is um, should be showing on this screen here. Um, and we will pause uh, at the end of each presenter segment to, um, to respond to questions. Uh, and we'll either uh, discuss it aloud with the presenter or, uh, or I will type an answer uh, back to you directly. And we may share uh, comments or questions in the question box with all participants if appropriate. Um, this training is being recorded, so we can make it available to you and the field on the LSNTAP website. You will receive an email once this material has been posted, and we hope you'll share it with anyone in your network who may be interested. Okay, and with that, I think uh, we are ready to get started. Um, again, today's webinar is Technology Strategies to Build and Mobilize Pro Bono Networks. Uh, my name is Mike Renewald. I'm from Pro Bono Net. Uh, we are joined by a wonderful panel today, uh, Nancy Anderson, who's the Director of Pro Bono uh, from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, is joining us to talk about the Election Protection Program. Uh, Pat Malone, the Associate Director of the Immigration Advocates Network, uh, is here to talk about the Stand With Immigrants Project. Uh, Susan Marks, the Pro Bono Legal Manager at Catholic Charities New York Pro Bono Project, is with us to discuss her project that uh, we've actually collaborated on. Uh, for her Pro Bono Projects website. And Lori Myler, who's the Director of Pro Bono Legal Services at Atlanta Legal Aid Society, is here to uh, talk about their Pro Bono Project as well that we have also collaborated on. Um, and so what, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about different models from sort of different geographic and uh, different points along the way in terms of development and, and reach of various programs. So, uh, this is, I think, a great panel to give us a broad perspective on uh, the different kinds of technology strategies that you can consider adopting for your pro bono program. And before we get started, I just want to note, um, I did mention I'm a program manager with Pro Bono Net. Uh, pro bono Net is a national nonprofit founded 20 years ago this year. We work, we work to bring the power of the law to all by building cutting-edge digital tools for advocates volunteers and the public, and by strengthening collaboration in the civil justice sector. Since Pro Bono Net's beginning, we've worked with legal services programs and state bar associations to develop technology strategies that help them collaborate more effectively and build greater capacity to connect, engage, mobilize, and support pro bono attorneys. So today's presentation is right in Pro Bono Net's wheelhouse, and uh, we're really excited to be part of bringing this to you. So with that, I uh, just want to remind everyone that we will pause for questions and discussion in between each segment. Uh, so do please uh, 
send us questions as the segments uh, are proceeding. But I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to, uh, to Lori Myler uh, from the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, who's going to talk with us about their pro bono project in Metro Atlanta. So Lori, I'm going to hand off presenter to you. Thanks, Mike. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, also on the phone with me joining um, from Atlanta Legal Aid is Whitney Stone, who's our um, volunteer coordinator. So I'm going to let Whitney also introduce herself when she starts to talk about um, sort of going through our website. I just wanted to make sure that everybody can now see our website. Yes. I'm assuming that folks would let me know if they can't. So great. So yes, um, Atlanta. Okay, fabulous. Atlanta Legal Aid is a five office, five county project um, or organization, LSC organization in Metro Atlanta that um, is has a uh, a PBIF innovation grant from LSC to um, partly to do some work related to pro bono. And so we've created Legal Aid Pro Bono, which is the project that I work with, which connects the private attorney to all types of core legal services work that our office handles. Pretty much the full representation case placement um, is handled by pro bono coordinators in our offices while we work out of my unit on limited scope and brief service large scale projects and then direct representation projects for um, clients that are served program wide. So we have a full scale of pro bono things that we do. Now historically, pro bono was pretty decentralized at um, Legal Aid. And so in 2017, we rebranded ourselves and basically went from Atlanta Legal Aid with multiple offices throughout Atlanta to one centralized um, program. And along with that, we shifted our focus and developed a volunteer web website in connection with pro bono net that basically is dedicated just for volunteers. And so it's legalaidprobono.org, and it basically has three core functions. The core functions, as you can see from our site, are to connect volunteers to direct representation cases, to our pro bono projects, um, or to get tools or trainings to fall into one of those groups. And so that's what our core function of the unit is, and that's the same thing. Our site mirrors that. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Whitney, who's going to talk a little bit about how we've incorporated technology into that strategy that I just discussed. OK, hi, everyone. This is Whitney, and I am the volunteer coordinator here at Atlanta Legal Aid. Um, so I do a lot of our graphic design, marketing, and web design. I work a lot with our technology um, to kind of encourage volunteers to get involved in our work. Um, so we have used a lot of different technology as part of our um, pro bono strategy. Uh, we're trying to reach more volunteers. Um, specifically, we're also trying to reach a lot of non-attorney volunteers. And so we're trying to use technology to be able to enhance our ability to do that. Um, so we have a variety of different um, tools on our website that we're using. Um, Lori's showing right now the About Us page, which um, just gives more information about who we are, how volunteers can get in contact with us, um, how they can volunteer. And then we also have a lot of clients who do kind of fall into our page, so places to kind of direct them to the right spot as well. Um, we also have our Neighborhood Offices page, um, which because we have five separate offices, five county offices, um, each office has specific volunteer needs and specific things that um, they um, want in volunteers. And so each of them has their own pro bono page that they can use um, and update on their own um, so that they can add any special projects um, and any events that they're doing as far as pro bono goes um, to their specific page. So that just helps kind of um, also with volunteers who specifically want to work with one of our uh, specific offices. They can go to this page and kind of learn a little bit more about that office and find volunteer opportunities there. Um, we also have our tools and training page. So one of the main goals of our website was to be able to train volunteers to kind of remove a lot of the administrative burden um, of training volunteers that pro bono coordinators have. So there's a lot of training and um, that we have to give volunteers. So 
one of the purposes of the site was to connect volunteers with resources so that they could be trained prior to starting volunteering or throughout the process. They could find training materials that they need, resources, anything like that. Um, they can kind of get access to that on their own or we can direct them directly to our site. Um, another strategy that we're using as far as technology goes, we uh, are trying to get the word out about our work um, and about what we do and about our volunteer opportunities. So we send out monthly emails that you can see right now to all of our volunteers. Um, and we also do a lot of um, social media and marketing um, as well. So that's some of the technology we use to try and encourage our volunteers to get involved in our work and do place cases and um, to advertise like training opportunities and things like that. We use social media and email as part of our technology and pro bono strategy. So we also have our calendar tool, um, which is one of the most useful tools for us because it allows us to centralize all of our training and the events into one location so that volunteers can easily see when there's upcoming clinics, when there's upcoming CLE opportunities, when there's upcoming training. They can see it all in one location. Um, because we have the five separate offices, each office has their own specific training that they do. And so having it all in a centralized location makes it a lot easier for volunteers to be able to attend training, attend clinics, um, and attend any of our events. Um, then we also have our cases tool, and we use this to be able to place cases, specific cases, um, with volunteers. So this tool allows a volunteer to come and review a case. So they can log in and get a little bit more information about it. Um, they can contact someone about it if they're interested. They can see the time commitment, and then they can like review the case and accept that case. Uh, they can also filter based on county, um, they can filter based on the time commitment um, or the topic of case, so they can kind of filter through that and choose cases that will work best for them and for their schedule. And then we also have our Get Involved page. And this page we specifically created because we had so many non-attorney volunteers who were reaching out to us. And so we wanted a place that we could send them um, without having to explain every single project to every law student that contacted me. Um, it was really, really helpful to be able to have a page where we could just direct them and they could find opportunities um, related to what kind of volunteer they are. So for example, we have our law student page. And so this lists all of our volunteer opportunities for all of our law students. They can click on the little pictures and get more and more information about those specific projects. So instead of me having to explain every single project that we have or law students to every law student that contacts me, they can come in here and learn more about the projects and then tell me what projects they're interested in. So I will typically just send, um, if a volunteer reaches out to me, I'll just send them directly to the law student page and say, which volunteer opportunities interest you, and then I can kind of direct them based on that. But it saves me a lot of administrative time, and it's just a great way for them to get more information about our volunteer opportunities. We also have our library tool, and this tool has a lot of helpful information for all of our volunteers, and a lot of our resources. We also have like our website training videos, so that's another technology a tool that we've been using is videos. Um, we have videos that explain how to use the website. Um, we have videos about a bunch of different legal topics so they can come in here and watch these videos. And that saves us time as well because they are able to quickly um, just watch the video on their own instead of us having to explain how to use the website to them as well. So that's a very helpful tool that we use and a helpful like technology that we've been using as well. And I and I think those um, those all of the, the the various types of technology that Whitney described has been really integrated in our core strategy. So we'd like to be able to allow I mean 
we want volunteers to get trained. Um, this website allows us to connect them more quickly and easily to the training materials. We want volunteers to be informed about our work. That's what this website is designed to do, is to be able to find about sort of the depth and the breadth and the scope of the work that we are doing, who we serve. And so a lot of the, the features on the website support our core work that we're ex engaging in in this um, unit anyway. And so um, one of the things we wanted to sort of talk about as well is just challenges that we've encountered with our technology strategy, just because if you're thinking about putting a site together or um, launching into t new technology, it's always good to kind of consider some of what may be the roadblocks. And so one thing that, that we have found out is that even though we have so much information on here um, through our pages, going to um, the various um, pages on the website, this is not going to replace the core functions that we have. This isn't going to replace a telephone. And so there are going to be times when we're still going to have to get in touch with um, our volunteers to place cases. We posted one here today. The client, um, and I'll clear my fi I'll, um, filters. But this client needs assistance at mediation with a contractor who did not finish promised work. It would be great if this case, if somebody's looking on the website and they take this case, but it's not necessarily going to be the only strategy we employ. So I think, think of technology as a supplement to what you're already doing and not necessarily a complete replacement. Whitney and I still spend a lot of time onboarding volunteers independently. There's just going to be folks that are not going to um, accept the technology as readily as other ones. So I guess my caveat there is technology is only as useful as the users who use it. Not everyone likes technology. Um, also staying tied to your goal when you have a lot of competing interests can be tough. Um, we were a, when we first started our site, if you notice now on our projects, we have 21 projects. We started out with projects for almost everything. And we realized that perhaps volunteers had too many options, and we were going too narrow, and folks were getting lost. We'd rather connect them to a bigger area of law and then filter them through that to the right opportunity from there. So we, we've worked on sort of trying to capture every potential user out there um, in the interwebs to sort of saying what are our big selling points that we want to work with and trying to advertise to those. So those are a couple of challenges we've encountered with the technology strategy. And then along with that, I wanted to go ahead, Whitney and I wanted to make a couple of recommendations for other programs looking to use technology as part of their pro bono projects. One thing would be is really to scope the project well. We knew right from the start that we wanted this three um, panes uh, home page to be able really to draw folks in and immediately place them with work. And so we've had to really continue to think through that and work with Pro Bono Net on what that looks like, how we can make sure that we're really staying tied to that mission and not lose sight of it and, you know, sort of go down the path of appealing to every single, you know, user out there. So that's one thing. Really be, really scope it well at the beginning. But be flexible, because during the process you're going to come into challenges, and what you may think would be a, a great op would be a great feature doesn't end up actually um, working out that way for the user. So we had some feedback about the fact we originally did not have a neighborhood offices tab, and folks basically the feedback was I want to know how I can volunteer in my neighborhood office, and so we worked with Pro Bono on that to make sure that that was one of the core functions of the site is to get people connected to vocal to volunteer locally. So that was one of the things that we did. So we were flex flexible there. And then um, really be mindful of who's going to maintain this site, who's going to take care of it after it's launched, who's going to make sure that you're posting cases, who's going to be placing the cases, who's going to be adding new users or approving new users as users come onto the site. It takes Maintenance does take energy and resources. And because you've invested so much in the site, and we really find that it's a great vehicle to, to showcase our work, we want to make sure that it stays fresh and dynamic. So think about who is going to take ownership over that after you are done. Um, and Whitney, I know you had a couple other um, tips that you wanted to provide. Yeah, so the one thing I wanted to add was that you just need to know your audience and know the people who are going to be using your technology. Um, so you don't want to spend your time developing technology and creating a website um, or any other technology for like volunteers or users who aren't going to use it because that's not a good use of your time. Um, so you need to find out useful information um, first before you start developing technology. So through surveys, focus groups, um, we also use Google Analytics 
Um, so for example, our site, only 2% of our users are seniors. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time developing pages for like senior attorneys. We have a page, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time working on this page because I know that there aren't a lot of senior attorneys who are using our site. Um, and we also, for example, Google Analytics has kind of told us that 40% uh, of our users are using their de uh, devices to access our site. So we want our site to be mobile friendly as well. Um, so that's like another important consideration is you just need to kind of know your audience, know how they're going to be using your technology, and kind of know who they are so that you don't waste your time um, developing something that's not going to be useful. So I think we're ready for if there are any questions, Mike. Yes, that, that was great. Lori and Whitney, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions came in. Uh, one from Deborah Hansen, um, did a company create the training videos for, uh, for the volunteers, the, the training videos that you have on your site? No, we did all of that in-house. We found that if you have somebody that's pretty good with technology in-house, you can go ahead and develop those. There's some, we've used some free to pretty, I say relatively inexpensive, Whitney can probably comment on the price technology to do that and if you find somebody with a good voice they can do voiceovers basically you can just go ahead and record um, some information about the site or we put together some presentations and then went ahead and made them into slideshows and recorded them into videos um, the videos we we really thought were a great way to launch the to the site and it's also a way to keep volunteers engaged and so on our social media strategy, Whitney may post on LinkedIn next week, here's how to use our cases tool. Are you looking for a new case? Here's how to use our cases tool. Then maybe you know later in the month, we may go ahead and have a short video on how to do the library. So it also gives folks an opportunity to see the site and not necessarily, um, and I think that video technology, if you're running it in your social media campaigns, grabs more audience and allows folks to stay longer and engage more. And so it also allows them to see parts of the site. If they're not necessarily navigating the site on their own, they're going to learn about the site through those videos. But we did them all ourselves. Great. And then we have another question um, from uh, Danielle Ramos. Actually, a couple. And I'll, I'll skip down to the, the more recent one. Uh, she asked if you're using Facebook at all. Yes. Yes. And I noticed, I think maybe you had a feed on, on your site. There you go. Yep. So it links, exactly. We link to it. And then on our pro bono news, um, there's a feed to our Facebook, or there's a link to our, our Facebook feed shows up there as well so that folks can scroll through and kind of figure out. Right now, we have a, a, our awards breakfast. So this is a video that Wendy made as well. We have a rewards breakfast next week. Um, and so a lot of that is focused on that right now. So, but yes. Great. And then um, I see a hand up from uh, Rebecca Pritchett. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Rebecca. You're, you should be unmuted, Rebecca, if you want to ask a question. Oh, apparently it was inadvertent. So that's okay. <laughs> no worries there. Great. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions in the question box. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to pop those in there. Yeah, and I have to I have to give a shout out to Mike. Mike's been really an excellent partner to work with. I think it's great to have um, folks who are who are non techies. I'm a, I'm an attorney um, to be able to work with to sort of say, here's what my vision is. Tell me how we can execute it, what we can do, and what we can't do. And so I think that's another a, another thing that's great to think about when you're looking at project partners who um, can communicate well with like you know non legal. Um, concepts and translating legal concepts into tech concepts. So we appreciate that. Well, Lori, I really appreciate that. Completely unsolicited shout out, I should just say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I really appreciate that. And it's uh, it's been a pleasure to work with an organization that's been so insightful about how to do this. So uh, I think, yeah, this is a great example for the community. Um, Danielle, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, you said you have more questions. and. Uh, I feel free to fire away. 
Oh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Oh, okay. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think this is a really beautiful website and very well executed. And I think it incorporates a lot of the ideas that we're, that we have going, but it's just so nicely organized and it looks so nice. And I, I'm curious how we can use uh, pro bono net to sort of take away some of these ideas, like the, the calendar, for instance. And yeah, I don't Danielle, know uh, feel free. Feel free to reach out to me after the session, or definitely, you know, I'm sure Laurie and Whitney would be happy to uh, to talk with you about their experience using the uh, our system. But yeah, definitely happy to talk with you uh, about possibly adopting this for your program. Where are you from? Um, Portland uh, Legal Aid Services of Oregon, uh, Portland Regional. Oh, great. So, is with okay, the calendar, great. is there a mechanism for for volunteers to sign up? via the calendar or RSVP through the calendar? Yes, there is. Let's figure out what's a good one to go to, Whitney. Um, uh, I know I Gwinnett. Don't know we any right now that have the registration set up, but I believe, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a registration function built into the calendar. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. we recently built that as a part of a pro bono innovation fund project uh, with Volunteer Lawyers Project of Boston, uh, and it allows members who are registered uh, with the site to uh, to sign up for specific events, and you can define uh, the number of time slots and uh, the upper limits uh, if you want to set one for the number of attendees, and uh, it has a lot of functionality that you find in some of the commercial products out there, but integrates it directly into the calendar tool. And is then th that would enable other staff to check the calendar to see who is signed up? Yes. If they're, yes, if they have admin privileges on the site, they would be able to see that, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'll, I guess I'll follow up about that maybe. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, actually, I think uh, to stay on time, we, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next uh, segment. I saw that there were a couple of other questions in the question box. Uh, Lori and Whitney, if you're able to uh, respond to those, that would be great. Um, but I'm going to, at this point, hand things off to Susan Marks from the Catholic Charities New York uh, Pro Bono Project, and uh, she's going to give us uh, an overview of her project in uh, in New York. So let me go ahead and hand that off to Susan. There you go, Susan. And you might be muted. Great. Do you guys see what I'm seeing? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susan Marks, and I'm the pro bono legal manager for Catholic Charities New York. Um, and we are we're kind of set up in an interesting way. Some of you may be familiar with Catholic Charities offices throughout the country, but it's, we are a huge social services agency, and our legal department is actually quite small. It's part of the Immigrant and Refugee Services Division, and we only do uh, immigration-related legal work. And so our pro bono project is exclusive to immigration-related legal work as well. So uh, kind of the... Um, so the overview is that there's the, the, the social services agency has 90 federation agencies, and one of those is my agency that I work for, Catholic Charities Community Services, and we are the direct service provider of the archdiocese. So we provide all sorts of uh, legal and social services, and it's interesting because in our immigration uh, division, we have over 40 years of experience uh, helping immigrants you know, reunite with families, obtain work authorization. Uh, we also do quite a bit of removal defense. But never before, just a couple of years ago, did Catholic Charities engage in um, pro bono work with members of the community, lawyers who could could lend their, their services to 
uh, immigrants in need of, of uh, legal assistance. So we launched um, in early 2018, and we were funded to be a statewide project, which, you know, outside of New York City, there are there's quite a lot of need in immigrant communities, and New York as a state is quite large. Uh, lots of people who come to visit in New York City, um, you know, focus on the city as the, the main place in the state, but that's uh, that's not where a lot of our immigrant communities reside. And so the Archdiocese of New York actually flows up all the way into the seven counties of the Lower and Mid-Hudson Valley. And so a lot of our work uh, that takes place outside of the city is focused there, including our pro bono project. And it, it, we receive referrals in a number of different ways. And one of those ways is you'll see this uh, photo on the homepage of the site. This is a photo of one of our community legal clinics. So every month, we uh, use attorney and non-attorney volunteers to uh, attend a rotating community legal clinic in one of the seven counties of the Hudson Valley. So we bounce all around, and we will take our staff up, but we also use about 30 volunteers for each of these events, and we're able to see about 100 people over the course of the day. And we do generalized immigration legal screenings and are able to identify people who may have some form of relief uh, through that project. And we have a couple of other vehicles through which we identify cases uh, that, that would then be evaluated to flow into the pro bono project, but that is one of the primary ways. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but one of the greatest things about this website is that there were a lot of discrete, uh, smaller projects uh, that were taking place at, at Catholic Charities for the past four to five years. So our community legal project is one. Another is called the Immigration Court Help Desk, where 10 days a month we staff uh, the immigration court to, to provide similar screenings to individuals in removal proceedings. Um, those two projects are wonderful to give people information, but it was there was really a point where the, the clinic would end and there wasn't necessarily a referral that could be made. So if there was an internal capacity, there wasn't a next step for that individual. But now, through the Pro Bono Project, we've built this new capacity to place those individual matters with uh, primarily solo and small firm uh, attorneys. We also work with large firm, large law firm attorneys uh, and retirees. So our vision, really, is to expand capacity in the lower Hudson Valley, where it really doesn't exist now. And I just give you all of that uh, background to sort of uh, have a lens through which to, to look at what we're trying to do with this website. Because the main goal of the website is to be able to, um, to really refine our remote supervision so that when we can go beyond the Hudson Valley to beyond, beyond parts of New York where we can easily drive to up in, in the North Country and Buffalo and near Albany and the Capital Region, that if we are able to engage pro bono attorneys who live in those communities and want to represent individuals in those communities, that we can help facilitate that and we can also help with uh, the mentorship that is required for this type of work because it is so uh, complex. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit about, you know, about that, about the vision for the project and sort of where we are. We're definitely still young, just under uh, two years old. And we launched this website in early 2019, so in February of 2019. And it's we primarily use it for volunteer uh, engagement, for recruitment, of course, as Legal Aid was saying, also to to really get the word out about our work, for it to be a one-stop shop about the different types of, of programs and projects and opportunities that we have available, whether it's a, a single-day volunteer opportunity through our community legal clinics or the Immigration Court Help Desk, um, or for full case representation. And so what I'd like to do today is to walk you guys uh, through the website, which was also built in partnership with Pro Bono Net. And it's just uh, another example of how you can use their, uh, 
out of the box but highly customizable solution to build a website that is really perfect and tailored to you and to your programs and, and what you want to do with it. So of course we have uh, our homepage that has this slider up here. This is our pro bono team that you see. And then if you scroll down a bit more, this is uh, just our first opportunity to speak to our volunteers. So we want to tell them why. Like it, it starts with you. We want to tell them why this platform exists, that it's for them. Uh, that we really designed it in a way to give them the tools that they need to be competent and effective uh, to assist in their in their pro bono representation. So different buttons that can take you to, to directly to other spaces within the site. Uh, you're able also to see new cases that have been posted. I actually posted a few new ones this morning. Uh, you can sign up for our email updates here. And then this uh, section right here uh, directs to the Catholic Charities New York blog, which is separate from uh, Catholic Charities Community Services, but connects us with the larger agency. So we wanted to have a, a space that would, would connect us with the agency as well. So here, of course, is, is uh, pretty typical information. So information about our pro bono project. There's our, our larger team. Um, we talk a little bit about how we are organized here, just so people can understand sort of where they are. One of my favorite sections, actually, is our, is our Meet the Team. So we really wanted to show people who we are, talk to them about the work that we've done previously, uh, and you know how we're engaged in pro bono. And then lastly, our frequently asked questions. So as both Lori and Whitney um, mentioned, we there's a lot of of uh, person-to-person -person interaction in when you're working in the pro bono space, right? So you're doing a lot of phone calls, you're doing a lot of networking, and we wanted to be able to answer as many questions as we could just from the outset. So, you know, people can, the other thing that's great about this site, and I'm going to talk to you guys about it and show you in a few minutes, but you can create an account and log in and have access to all of our trainings that we wanted to make sure uh, to have behind, you know, a join wall. But most of this information, aside from our resources uh, section, you can access without joining the site. So you can just, so anyone can go come to our website and look at the frequently asked questions. They can go through some of these other pages, um, our, our pages about how the program works, where we talk about how we're different maybe from other immigration agencies who are placing pro bono cases. One of the ways uh, that we, we believe that we're a little bit distinct is that we really uh, focus on what we call high intensity mentorship. So Immigration is an incredibly complex area of the law, and particularly in today's climate, it's uh, really overwhelming and intimidating for somebody who's never done this type of work to be become engaged in it uh, for the first time, especially if they're doing uh, removal defense work. So those are, are real consequences for the person who you're representing that are, that can be scary. And so we wanted people to be able to see, you know, here are the ways that we're going to support you. So we have information about how we find the, the right case for them, a lot of which is actually done sort of on a one-to-one -one basis in terms of individual volunteer uh, interviews and me talking to people about what, what their goals are and what their strengths are. Uh, but we also, because we're part of a big agency, have this ability to help in a lot of logistical ways. And so though we do a full case placement, we really uh, keep eyes on, on that placement throughout the process. We also have uh, single day volunteer opportunities. This information is uh, just written information about the different opportunities we have available. but similar to uh, Legal Aid Atlanta. We have a calendar tool that has all of these opportunities. So this is the full calendar, but if you go back to the events list, you can see everything that is available throughout the course of the month. 
So here's our community legal clinic that we do once a month, the, the 10 different uh, days per month of the Immigration Court Help Desk. When we have live in-person trainings, we also put those uh, opportunities up here for our pro bono network. And we've actually launched an Immigration Court uh, Help Center in the Lower Hudson Valley that does similar work to uh, the pro se asylum workshops that we do through the Immigration Court Help Desk. So that is all uh, at our events tab. That's how you get to that events or calendar. And as they mentioned, we too are just starting to incorporate the registration uh, feature. But I think it's it's going to be a fantastic way for us to have all of that integrated into one space. So that's very exciting. And then finally, we do also um, really encourage non-lawyer volunteers to get involved with our work, either as uh, what we call a case support volunteer, so almost a, a paralegal type person who would work with a pro bono attorney as part of a legal team, or, or we also use uh, those folks who are not lawyers um, at our community legal clinics, at the Immigration Court Help Desk. Those events are, are uh, supervised by attorneys. And so really, we use volunteers to do the interviewing part of that phase to really gather information on the front end. And so uh, it's great to have, to have non-lawyers for those options as well. But now we get really to the heart of our, of our project, right? And that's our cases. So I'm just going to go to our available cases. And the cases tool you'll see is quite similar to what you saw on Legal Aid's website. Uh, it's definitely built on, on the same part of this platform. And if you go to an individual case, you can see uh, that the case facts are, are laid out for you, also a legal assessment. Um, What's happened by the time a case gets to this point is that it has been it has gone through both a consultation phase that we can really gather information, but then we've also uh, put it through a secondary evaluation, and now it's really ready for placement. And so we use this cases tool both as um, sort of a way to share information with the community, both both people who are, are members uh, and and not. So even if you are not a member of the site, you can still have access to look through any of these cases. And then finally, I uh, just want to highlight our resources section. So I'm not logged in right now, so you'll notice that when I click on to enter the resource library, it's like, oops, no, you have to join. Um, and that's just because we want to make sure that folks who are getting all of our training information, because we have lots of practice templates here. We have, um, no, it's not a brief bank exactly, but because we are working with pro bonos who really have never done immigration work before, we wanted to have samples. And so we've redacted everything that's on here, uh, but just to show you what, what, what we've done here. Um, we have a sample from, from an actual um, you know, I-130 cover letter, which is required to, to file a family-based petition. So for any of our attorney volunteers who are working on a family-based case, they can come here, they can take a look at what it should look like, um, and then they can feel more comfortable that they actually are doing it right. But we also, of course, want to review everything that they have put together. So that's, that's our site. Um, in terms of what really has worked well, I mentioned this earlier, but, but having everything in one place is really very powerful because of the evolution of how these different projects have kind of come together underneath our pro bono programming. And so all of our work is really connected in a meaningful way. We can explain how cases come in through our brief services events and are identified and then uh, developed and evaluated and then prepared and packaged for case placement. So what, we'd re what we really love is for our volunteers to come in and start with us at one of those single day events. And we really encourage that so that they can get to know us a little bit before they move on to um, taking a case because it is such uh, a tremendous responsibility. So I would say, you know, our, our technology strategy is definitely similar 
to legal aids in terms of wanting to focus on reaching a wider audience, um, providing this comprehensive training space, uh, which is a really huge draw for our particular volunteer profile, which is people who have never done this work before. And then just using the site also as a starting point to introduce people to the breadth and depth of what we're offering. So we, we also use email newsletters, um, similar to others, and uh, just really try to reach people in a variety of ways. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just challenges that we have encountered with, uh, with technology and with our strategy. I mean, because our project is so new, we actually launched the website concurrently with building a project from scratch. So we were really building our workflow in terms of pro bono case placement um, at the same time as we were working with Mike to build the project, which <laughs> was probably, I mean, it was a strategic calculation because we we're launching a new initiative. But as a result, some of the workflow um, capabilities of the website are a little bit different than how we have tweaked our actual workflow uh, in response to issues as they arose. And so this is just one example of technology doing a tremendous amount to improve our process, to improve data collection, volunteer engagement, all of those things. But just like uh, Lori said, this is not going to replace the core functionality of a pro bono uh, director or manager uh, or a volunteer uh, coordinator like Whitney. I do an individual uh, conversation and, and do individual vetting of every single attorney with whom we place a client because it's the stakes are too high for us not to do that. And so there is still that individualized work uh, you know, that, that goes in, but we're delighted to have, you know, tools that help make that easier. Um, similarly, another challenge, of course, is capacity to keep the website current and updated. So it's always really important to sort of think that through and what that is going to look like uh, for you. And in terms of recommendations for, for you guys who are, are here with us today who are looking to use technology as part of your project, I think that at the beginning of any new initiative, um, my advice based on our experience would be to consider maybe a phased implementation uh, that if you're launching a new project really launches uh, the project first and gets its legs under it a little bit, but then has sort of a phase two where you are really incorporating technology after you've had time to test sort of your, your theoretical model and your hypotheticals. Um, and really trying to think through that workflow and the needs of your project at a, at a super granular level before applying a technology solution. Um, the department in which I work is uh, called Special Projects. And the way that we work in Catholic Charities is instead of doing individual, traditional, one-to-one -one direct representation, we go out to where immigrant communities are. And we do that in a variety of ways. But one of our uh, sort of main touchstones is really always being able and willing to iterate and adapt and change and you know that that we're not failing if something doesn't go exactly the way we thought it would we're just learning so that we can tweak it and change it and do something a little bit different uh, the next time and I really think that this also uh, applies to your technology tools and solutions and uh, Mike and Pro Bono Net were really fantastic to work with and continue to be fantastic to work with, uh, despite the fact that our lunch was, you know, 10 months ago now. Uh, there are things that, that we speak about, about, about tweaking and, and making different, um, you know, on a pretty frequent basis. So I'm happy to be able to share our site and our project with you and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Susan. And I, again, w want to add that was unsolicited, but definitely appreciate that. And, you know, it's been, I, you know, the feeling is definitely mutual. Um, you've also been a fantastic partner with us uh, working through this. Um, and so, yeah, uh, these kinds of partnerships are extremely valuable. And um, it's great that you're 
you know, here to, to share it with everybody. Um, we did have one quick question. I think we really just have time for this one question before we move to the next segment. Um, from Paul Ochner, uh, what percentage of your available cases get picked up by the website users? That's a great question, and it's actually kind of a tough one for me to answer because I really use it as a dual uh, tool. There's, there's sort of a three-pronged approach, which is the newsletter that goes to more than 300 people in our network, uh, the website, and then also sort of just individual conversation by me, and I use them uh, kind of all collectively. So in part, some of, some of the cases that are on the website are there really to drum up um, you know, placement opportunities and interest from people at a later time. So it might not be that specific case, uh, but it is you know, eventually gonna, gonna be placed regardless of, of the vehicle through which that happens. So I mean, in the end, it ends up being 100%, but I, I understand that <laughs> that's not the, um, the, probably the best answer to the question. Great. Okay, well, uh, if any, anybody has any additional questions for Susan, please feel free to put those in the question box, and I will make sure that those get passed along to her. But um, we're going to go ahead and shift to our next segment, uh, and Pat Malone is going to talk with us about the Stand with Immigrants project. So, Pat, I'm going to hand over the screen sharing to you. Great. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mike. Even though Mike and I are colleagues at ProBonoNet, I'm going to talk about a site that ProBonoNet did not make. <laughs> so it will give you a, diff a, different, a different tool, and we'll talk about some of the functions and to some extent, you know, the differences and, and what I had to get used to. So we're Immigration Advocates Network. We are 11 years old, part of Pro Bono Net, which, as Mike mentioned, is 20. Um, and Ian, as we call ourselves, was created with national partners. Um, we have a network of more than 8,000 uh, individual nonprofit members and nearly 3,000 pro bono members. We don't do any direct services. We are uh, our our mission is, um, you know, working with partners and using technology to improve access to justice. We have a number of projects out there. Some of you may be familiar with these. Um, the one I'm going to talk about today is Stand with Immigrants. Some of these are um, sites that we've created with partners and spun off. Um, we've had some other projects too, like Women Step Forward with the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Oportunidad, a mobile app that we created with LULAC. Um, and then some are, are projects that we hold closely and we work uh, hand in hand with partners, um, you know, throughout our sort of outreach and development and um, design work. So this is our core site. Um, this was our first site, and it has a uh, nonprofit resource center and a pro bono resource center, and some features that you may recognize from the sites that we've looked at already, right? A calendar, for example. Um, and we have a tremendous library with you know, oh, tens of thousands of resources. It's more of a clearinghouse. It doesn't have that same kind of selection. Um, and selectivity that uh, some of the other presenters are talking about, the, the resources are not um, exactly tailored toward uh, pro bonos. So um, it's good for practitioners who are already immigration in the immigration field and looking to um, contribute their time and expertise for pro bono cases. Um, this also includes a volunteer guide, which we updated in the past couple of years to include some volunteer contact guide or volunteer coordinator contact information because as you all know, a lot of times someone will have the um, interest in, in working at a local nonprofit, but it's sometimes hard to reach the right person and to get started. So this site in the past year we've had oh, a little more than 30,000 site visits and sessions. Um, and to some extent, you might think, well, this is our, our pro bono resource. But uh, a couple of years ago, we saw an opportunity with partners to reach a different audience, right? With the, um, in the wake of the Trump administration's intense enforcement efforts and anti-immigrant rhetoric, there was, uh, you know, backlash. And 
not only lawyers wanted to become involved and and speak out on behalf of of immigrants and and work for justice but other folks were interested too interpret interpreters translators uh, social workers, healthcare providers. So we saw with our partners um, an opportunity and a moment to uh, maybe harness this passion and uh, help bring people along in our work um, and uh, help maybe change, you know, some of some of the conversation and and give people a place to 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 find those opportunities to um, connect with advocates. So we launched in around May 2017 the Stand with Immigrants site. These are the folks that uh, worked with us and were in conversation with us as we thought about how to uh, respond in this moment in time. And um, we'll talk a little bit about partnerships because, you know, this was a very intense time in, in our fields history, we had to scramble to respond to changes in policy, to understand how to talk about our work, and to scale up and actually help people who were being arrested or detained. And so there was a lot going on, and organizations were pulled in many different directions, and there were many uh, efforts and partnerships to create new projects around this time as well. So in working with our partners, we we thought about how we could engage a broader audience and use social media and do targeted trainings and welcome new lawyers and other professionals. Um, but we also were looking at how we could bring in people who were outside of our field. We decided to work with a nation builder. It is a different, um, it's, you know, in some ways similar to Pro Bono Net in that it has this sort of customizable and out of the box tools. And we were interested in the kind of the campaign features that would help us work more closely with people who signed up, who decided to take the pledge and stand with immigrants. We would provide them sort of more targeted information, engage them through social media channels and through newsletters and alerts. We had, uh, we built resources and information for educators, for uh, translators and interpreters, for healthcare providers, for mental health professionals, and then also general opportunities and calls for volunteers. This is contains another iteration of our volunteer guide that's on our Pro Bono Resource Center at the Ian Core site. But it also has in like a separate calls to action, separate postings from organizations around the country, uh, both national uh, projects such as, you know, CARA or Dili Project for people who are interested in doing um, detention or border work, but also local and regional projects like, for example, Esperanza in LA was organizing a lot of um, pro bonos and offering trainings and we might include or feature their project or include their calendar events so that folks who come to the source and come to our site could find opportunities to get trained, to learn about the law in basic ways, um, to take action, and to follow the news. So, as I mentioned, we were using a different platform and strategy. It included these sort of links to social media, and there were ways in which we could sort out the pledge takers for communications. So while it was a national site, we could sort and send an email to New Yorkers, you know, to alert them to some special training or event. Um, and in terms of like how we were able to reach people, a lot of that depended on engaging with our partners and having them um, you know, share with us the training opportunities and events and resources that they've created. Some of it was uh, using social media, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of the limits of our success <laughs> on um, Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we also sent out regular newsletters to the folks who signed up to get involved to stand with immigrants. And we offered some webinars. We worked with partners to offer webinars tailored for this this new audience, people who were maybe not uh, had never taken an immigration case and needed to understand the basics. 
or uh, people who were interested in providing other kinds of help and becoming involved in a different way. So in terms of some of the um, successes and uh, challenges, you know, like how did it go? So I, we found that with partners, we had there a wealth of knowledge and resources and that they were um, essential really in how we could engage with this audience. And one of the challenges was, I think, around um, having a, a shared kind of ownership of the project. We are, our meetings were sometimes kind of, you know, quiet or people were preoccupied. So I think we could have done a better job to think about, um, you know, how, how do we form these partnerships and what are our expectations and what can people um, commit? You know, were we holding regular meetings, whether folks had something to, to say or discuss? or not. So I think we could have done a better job in, in sort of defining and supporting our partners. Um, in terms of pledge takers, that was an interesting approach. We do have about uh, 2,000 people who signed up to take the pledge, and we expected more, but in retrospect, I don't know if that was realistic because that was an online form and they were going to give their contact information and they were making a commitment that not everybody would be comfortable making. So I think we would consider, you know, approaching that differently or maybe that would just be one level of engagement and that we could have thought a little bit more about site visits because our site visits in the past year we're not bad at about 30,000 users. That's actually pretty similar to our existing pro bono resource center, which, you know, again, is an intense clearinghouse for experienced lawyers. Um, so while it's not as impressive as, say, our directory, which gets, you know, 700,000 or more visits a year, it's still, it's still, it was doing okay. And so I think that maybe we could have defined success differently and thought about ways to engage people who were just coming to visit and were not ready to take the pledge. Um, for outreach, the newsletter was a success insofar as this was a really receptive audience. We found a something like uh, approaching 40% click rate on the newsletter, which is pretty much more than double what we see in other newsletters and publications. So um, we had this small but but very engaged um, audience to work with in the pledge takers. And then in terms of social media, maybe many of you find like that's a hard nut to crack with a new project uh, or a new, you know, Facebook page that's growing very slowly. And you know, we wish it would it would take off. We wish that we were able to sort of, um, you know, catch the attention and interest of more people in social media, but that has been um, a challenge for sure. And then in terms of the the technology, the, you know, the site does have some good features. It's not, for us, you know, we have, oh, you know, maybe four very active sites and another couple that we co-manage with partners. Um, so for us, it was a matter of also, you know, learning a new tool and it worked very differently and it, there weren't some of the efficiencies that we have. Uh, you know, when we update the news feed for the Immigration Advocates Network course site, it, it also updates the news feed on some of our other resources. So that was a little bit of, of a limit and a challenge for us. Um, in terms of recommendations, like what we, you know, might do or we might think about differently, um, as I mentioned, we would work harder to define and, and support our partnerships. Um, I also found that we needed to connect to the right staff. So when you're working on social media, um, but you're meeting regularly with program directors, you know, maybe you need to be connected to the the an organization's, uh, you know, communication staff and experts to help develop and grow, um, you know, your Facebook following and have them amplify the social media outreach that you're engaging in as well. Um, I also think that we should 
you know, as I mentioned, reconsider what the ask was. So for people who came to the site, you know, maybe the first thing we ask is not necessarily to, you know, take the pledge, but there might be another way that we engage people or we invite them back or we invite them to share this site with others. That might have been a more productive ask uh, for our audience. Um, and then finally, we have questions around, you know, what's our exit strategy? This is a, a, a kind of a campaign, and I don't mean in the political sense, but in a sort of defined goals, defined period of time, responding to the moment sense. So, you know, how and whether we wind down this site or whether we have the sort of, you know, resources and vision and staff to, um, to, to sustain the site. We are also considering, like, you know, what about our mission fit? Can Ian create and maintain sites for advocates and for immigrants and for volunteers? So we are thinking now about, like, what are the next steps for Stand with Immigrants? And, you know, how can we take this engaged, fierce <laughs> um, cadre of, of folks who signed up to Stand with Immigrants and sort of move them into the, to the next phase? And that's about it for me, Mike. Great. Thanks, Pat. I really appreciate that. And I, I think your, particularly your final point about exit strategy and sustainability is, uh, is an important one to think about um, because, you know, even though we, we do pour a lot of time and energy into these technology projects, I don't think we ever really think about the fact that they will have a finite existence. Um, whether it's because it's a specific issue that we're addressing or simply because uh, our users' expectations change or the way that we're engaging our users changes uh, out of necessity over time. So uh, and just as important as it is to think about uh, how to maintain the project while it's active is also thinking about how do you, uh, how do you flex and morph as conditions change. So uh, that's a very helpful insight. So I'm not seeing any questions currently in the in the question box. Um, I think you know if folks have any questions, they want to uh, pop in there. Um, please feel free to do so, and I'll I'll pass them along to Pat. Um, but we're we're doing great on time, so I want to continue that trend. Um, and I think I'll go ahead and and hand off to our next segment with uh, Nancy Anderson from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and she'll be talking with us about the election protection campaign. So Nancy, I'm gonna hand over the screen to you. Great, um, and I am going to try and show my screen. I am not, oh, there we go. Let's see if I can get this, oh, I don't mean to see me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so hopefully you are now just seeing one of my screens as opposed to two of my screens. Um, although we use technology, I am not always the best at using it. But um, I am uh, Nancy Anderson, the Director of Pro Bono, um, and I am with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., with the North Carolina office now. Um, and we have a dual mission of uh, to fight for civil rights and equal justice for all, but to do so uh, while utilizing the pro bono resources of the private bar. We have been around for 56 years, um, and unfortunately we'll probably be around for another 56. Um, but for this um, discussion, um, one of the main programs of the Lawyers Committee among a variety of, of work that we do is we are one of the lead organizations for election protection, which is the uh, country's largest nonpartisan voter protection coalition, uh, which consists of over, you know, hundreds of national, state, and local nonprofit organizations, both legal and non-legal, um, as well as law firms um, and individual volunteers. Um, it is a year-round program protecting the right to vote for individuals, uh, but for this discussion, I'm going to talk about how we use technology in the buildup and the use of volunteers on Election Day. And that consists of, um, let's see if I actually wrote what it does in the next slide. There we go. Um, on Election Day, it has um, 
um, primarily two things that we use technology for. It has um, national voter hotline, um, which is answered by trained legal volunteers. Um, that hotline is active actually throughout the year, but on election day, we often have over 20 call centers in different locations across the country, including at law firms. We also have um, mobile field programs where volunteers are roaming between different polling places and are uh, waiting at the election administration office to respond to any problems that are identified through the hotline or through other means. Um, we have between two and 6,000 volunteers on election day, all those partners. So you can imagine just how important technology is to sort of um, manage the flow of volunteers, the flow of information, and also sort of the next steps and who is taking care of what. Um, while it is such a large and somewhat unique program, I, I think there are definitely some takeaways that, that everyone on this call can have from our use of technology, um, even if it's just the fails that we've had and, and trying to learn from those. So again, even though this is somewhat unique, um, I still think it will hopefully be useful to folks. Uh, so we use technology for uh, four to five primary reasons. One is the National Voter Hotline Platform. Um, the second is their volunteer management system. The Our Vote Live, which is the um, tracking the calls and the issues that come in through the whole election protection uh, program. Um, the training platforms for all the volunteers and all the levels all the way up, including you know leads at, at call centers, captains who are in the field. Um, and then we also use technology for other means. So the National Voter Hotline platform is we pay a lot of money to use this. So it's not like this um, in particular is an option for a lot of folks. Um, but it is great in that it allows routing of calls from across the country to the various call centers depending upon the area code of the incoming call. And this is relevant, um, and I would love it if something like this was created, say, for responding to natural disasters where there was just one phone number. But if you have a 202 area code and we've chosen those calls to be routed to a call center in D.C. who are trained on D.C. law, they're only getting those calls. So that is just fabulous. Of course, now with cell phones, it's a little bit trickier, but folks do have the option to reroute themselves. Um, this platform allows for a wide range in call volume to five calls probably today to 30,000 on election day or more. Um, the other great thing is you can turn off a phone when a volunteer gets up to go to the bathroom. I remember in 2004, we didn't know how to do that. So like you would have someone poised standing there to take over the phone when someone needed to um, take a bathroom break. Um, and then we also have different phone numbers that allows us to partner with other national groups and have um, call centers in other languages, including Arabic, Spanish, um, and a variety of, of Asian languages, which is great. And in 2020, God help us all, we are going to be uh, having texting capabilities so that uh, voters can text us with their questions. Um, so another thing, actually, I guess that we do use uh, um, technology for is that we do get a lot of voicemails, because at times we're pack past capacity at midnight. Um, and so to go to a point I'll make later that there is inexpensive technology out there, we use Google to be able to, to um, move our voicemails into different Google Gmail boxes so that those voicemails can be listened to and then answered by the various call centers. So nothing fancy, just good old fast fashion Gmail accounts. Um, and it actually has, has worked out quite well. So the next um, mechanism uh, through which we use technology is for our volunteer management. With two to 6,000 volunteers on any election cycle, you can imagine it is tremendously difficult to both schedule those volunteers as well as um, uh, get their training scheduled. And this is an area in particular where we have failed uh, <laughs> many times. It is particularly challenging because 
we have field programs in 30 states and various locations in those states. We have call centers in, let's say, 10 states with multiple call centers in one city. Um, in some of those locations for the call centers, there's multiple days the call centers are opened. And so the ability for a volunteer just to look, let's say, in New York City at the volunteer opportunities and have them show up in a coherent way, see what's available, and actually sign up for a slot that is available um, has taken some long-term work with different platforms. And it doesn't end just there, because then the next thing we ask the volunteers to do is to sign up for training. Um, we don't want volunteers to have to take the training first and then sign up for a shift, because there's just a limited number of, of shifts, and we don't want volunteers to take the training, and then there's no opportunity for them to volunteer. But so once they sign up for a volunteer ship, they then have their um, list of training opportunities, which will vary depending upon whether they're at a call center or a field program, and then whether it's an in-person training, a live webinar, or a recorded training. So lots and lots of moving parts. Um, and then on the back end, we wanted our partners to be able to download those who are actually volunteering or attending a training at their location, either for security reasons or because they, to get folks in the building, or because they're managing the field program and they need to slot people into different shifts. So needless to say, this was, you know, it's a very challenging volunteer management platform, and we were incredibly fortunate to partner with We The Action, um, which is a, a 501c3 who, um, among many things, but one thing they do are is a place that volunteers can go and see what volunteer opportunities are out there. Um, and so it was fabulous that they uh, partnered with us on this, platform that, um, again, was very complicated. And for those of you out there, I definitely recommend looking at their website um, and, and seeing if they may be useful for you for posting your volunteer opportunities. I think they are really quite successful in reaching a large number of volunteers across the country. So I'm very happy to do a, an unrequested plug for uh, We The Action. But this here is just, you know, some screenshots to show you, um, you know, the variety of shifts that are available, the call center, the field program, the locations, and then how volunteers can sign up for a training, and then these uh, reminders and emails they get once they've uh, signed up for a shift. The third way we use technology is to track all of those phone calls and issues that come in. Um, so we've created an online um, management system where volunteers enter information online regardless from their location. It's searchable by location and issue. Um, you can limit access depending upon location so that the call centers in D.C. are only seeing those calls that are coming in from D.C. And that's useful because we need those folks to monitor them to respond to any bigger issues that maybe other folks aren't seeing. Um, and this information is used for a variety of reasons, including advocacy, um, litigation, but also just to make phone calls to the election administration office to try to fix a problem on election day. And this is a dashboard that we used working with Google, I believe. Um, and so here again was another way of using some free assistance. Um, I believe it's Google has a program where their employees can volunteer to help nonprofits on a variety of tasks. And we got a couple of folks to help build a dashboard so that folks could scroll and, and click on Texas and see the number of, of complaints that are coming in and whatnot. And I know I'm rushing through all this because then I want to get to the highs and lows of using all this technology. Um, and then we also use technology um, and various platforms to provide on-demand training and live webinars. We have online toolboxes for call centers and programs so that, again, a call center in DC can have this one link where all of the materials and all of the information that they need for their volunteers is in one place including the state FAQs, um, the voter registration lookup link for that location, um, and whatnot. 
And then, of course, last but not least, we have our 866-R-VOTE website, which has various resources, including an interactive uh, state map for individuals and voters to look up to uh, get information about voting. So a lot of platforms for a very large national program. Um, but some of the things that we've learned over the 15 years of trying to use technology, um, and some of this will be, I think, a repetition from what you've heard, and some of this we everyone already knows. But first and foremost, I think that we're all learning um, in the day and age of smartphones and how everything looks so pretty on, on our phones and so simple to use. You know, everyone has really high expectations of technology. They expect things to work well, to sort of meet everybody's needs. Um, but we know that tech costs a lot of money to develop. And so when you have that great game on your phone or maybe the, the app for your bank, that companies have spent millions of dollars to develop this technology or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars, but certainly none of us have that. Um, and so there's always this balance of trying to find the low cost or free resources to build the technology that you have, or what kind of money do we want to spend. And certainly one thing that the Lawyers Committee has learned is that we've often opted for the cheaper route and then we got what we paid for. Now, fortunately, there are these grants through LSC and partnerships with Pro Bono Net and We The Action that now are giving organizations some more options. But that is a it's a difficult balancing act of trying to figure out, you know, what we, how much we should pay to get something that actually works. One of the other challenges for us is that, as I was very quickly going through everything, our technology needs were actually really pretty complex. But at the same time, we ask for these platforms to do too much. And as a result, they sometimes didn't work because we overcompensated and wanted them to do everything. Our, our big joke internally now is, you know, we kept asking for the Porsche or the Lamborghini. We should have just gone for the minivan. You know, the Honda minivan is a good, sound car, and it meets your needs. We don't need the Lamborghini. Um, and so that's something else to, to keep it in mind, you know, really figure out what you need and sort of, you know, stick with that and, and try not to get all the bells and whistles. Um, you will have failures, you'll have hiccups, and, you know, I have found one of the best things is just to apologize <laughs> over and over. We had the hotline go down on election day, so we had 700 volunteers trying to answer phone calls and for two hours there were no calls. Um, you know, we had challenges with our val volunteer management um, system. It, things happen, um, but if you, again, if you just try to fix them, but also relay how you've tried to fix them, I've, I've found that definitely helps. If you're building something out, it's going to take a lot longer than you expect, so test, test, test. Give yourself time to test, test, test. Um, you also will need many, many conversations with your tech folks. So whether you're working with Pro Bono Net or someone else, and, and even with the We The Action folks, we had an amazing number of conversations. But sometimes we were saying blue, and they were saying red, and we couldn't hear that they were saying red, or we were saying blue, or whatever it was. It was only until like later, when the wrong color was up there, that we're like, oh. You were using tech speak. I was using legal speak, and we we missed you know what the other person was trying to say. Um, let's see. I said partnerships can be great, um, and um, certainly another point is that someone on the staff will be respond is going to have to be responsible for moving all this development forward. Um, if you don't have someone who takes lead, it can just falter and, and not move as fast as you need it to. And of course, for any site where you have materials posted, you, you need to constantly keep them up to date. And so you'll need staff resources for that. So that is my very fast presentation. Sorry I was talking so quickly, but I don't know if folks have any questions or not. 
Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, there, there was one question here uh, from Kingsley. Um, what's the cost for this type of service? And, and I think that that probably refers to, um, well, I think you could speak to any of the platforms that you talked about, if you like. Uh, just to give give the audience an idea, kind of what the costs look like for these. Sure. So a lot. At least the hotline platform is a lot of money. Um, and again, because we have such a, a, a high capacity needs during um, major election cycles, you know, it's between forty and eighty thousand um, dollars. And it's not just a one-time fee for the hotline. Um, it's we have to pay annual fees uh, for the We the Action. Um, they partnered with us, and we contributed, and they contributed, and I don't know how much they did, so I don't know in terms of the cost for that. FYI, if you want to post your volunteer opportunities on their site, I believe that's that's free, and they they are anxious to get more folks to post. Um, interestingly, right. like I the, that's true. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just saying I, I believe that's true. Yeah. Um, the ArtVote Live platform, we may have spent, I have no idea, because in all honesty, and I apologize, that was several years ago. But it's interesting, because now we're talking about how it's, all my analogies, it's like the 1985 Honda Civic. I don't know why I keep choosing Honda, but it's working, it's functioning. People know how to drive it and feel comfortable, but it's it's getting a little clunky. So um, we probably will have to do another one of those. And those webinar platforms are great, but those too cost money. Um, it may be, I think it also depends upon maybe the number of users, but that is not inexpensive either, but by far cheaper than all those other platforms. But again, there are partnerships that um, you that you can look into and grants, I know, to help with the funding or the cost of the technology. Excellent. And then we have one more question that I think we can throw out to all of our panelists uh, if they'd like to comment. It's from Chris Ramirez. And the question is, I'm on a digital team for a legal aid organization, and I have felt that sort of barrier with attorneys, the communication barrier. Um, what can I do to make communicating with them easier? Um, I try not to be too technical, and I try to be straightforward, but sometimes there's still confusion. So kind of crossing that, you, you said, Nancy, about the tech speak and the legal speak, um, I've run into this too. Um, but I'm curious if, if you'd like to start, Nancy, and then anybody else would like to share any thoughts on that. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to work into the training is not just the substantive expertise that they need to have, but also, you know, how to log on to the R Vote Live, how to enter information. So, so some of it is just having to show them the technology um, over and over and over. Um, but I don't have a, an easy answer. I don't know if other folks do. So this is Susan, Susan or Laurie, any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is Susan. I, I love this question. Um, I am an attorney, so but I'm a non-practicing attorney, so I sort of get where they're coming from, but it's not usually the wheelhouse of the work that I do on a daily basis. And I think for someone in that role, the best uh, the best thing that you can do is explain how the technology is going to help the clients. Uh, because I have found that our legal team, our pro bono supervising attorneys, like all they care about ever is the clients and the client outcomes, and that's okay because that's their job. That's what they're supposed to care about. And I, as a volunteer um, sort of manager and project manager, am, am meant to be focused on the project and the volunteers. And, of course, somebody in the digital and technology role is definitely meant to focus on how all of this can come together for all of the constituencies um, that the organization is serving, both internally and externally. So I think anytime you can tie it to what their own individual goals are and their client outcomes um, and make them see how it's going to benefit them, then that's, that's how you're going to make that. Uh, sale. Uh, 
Yeah, this is Lori. I also think that um, any time that you can sort of bridge the gap with graphic representations of like mock-ups of what you want or um, or just graphics in general, I think that we have found that um, just data, data. you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean like legal or non-legal. I think just trying to convey your message, and I guess I'm, I'm assuming that that's sort of what it is, those types of concepts. Go over with, with lawyers, I think, just like they do with everybody, if you can break them into more graphic representations or break it down into smaller pieces of information, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Great. Yeah, I, I think both of those pieces of advice are spot on. Um, coming at it from the tech perspective, um, I think that it is, I, I think you've hit on a, a really important point that um, frequently we can focus too much on the details of what the technology is going to do um, and, and we don't do enough to talk about how it fits into uh, the practice and how it's going to, as Susan pointed out, uh, you know, improve outcomes for clients. So if we sort of, sort of start from there and work our way backwards, uh, we can we can do a better job of communicating uh, the importance of of our digital and, and technical efforts uh, and help people get better context as far as understanding why uh, they should buy into that. Great. I think we, uh, we have time for one more question. We're a few minutes over, but I just wanted to um, throw out one last question from uh, from Joey Gitzeg. Uh Question is: Can you discuss web accessibility for various technology uses on virtual platforms? Uh, accessibility for screen readers. Uh, what about captioning for videos? Uh, and I think this is a question that's uh, relevant to everybody. Um, so, any any comments from the panelists on that one? It's definitely something that we've thought of. We just haven't, I don't think, incorporated it yet just because of the cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think uh, since Lori and Susan are both using the ProBononet platform, I can speak to that as well. Um, it's something that we have worked on at various points when there has been funding um, for specific projects. And uh, we actually just completed a comprehensive review of our statewide website that's a public information website platform on law help uh, but the pro bono net platform um, hasn't been reviewed for a while and so uh, I think that's a continuing challenge because it's very expensive to uh, to get the consultants uh, on board who are needed to do that work uh, not to mention the development work that's necessary to implement the changes um, good news on that though is that the more that we do this work uh, the closer to the surface uh, it becomes as as we think about how do we implement a particular design or how do we implement a particular functionality um, it's becoming more and more prominent in our thought process about well we need to make sure that uh, that this color scheme is accessible or we need to make sure that this functionality is consistent you know compatible with screen readers um, so I think it is something that's definitely on our radar um, the main challenge is is funding uh, and I think funders are starting to become more sensitive to that, uh, and and we're starting to see more movement on it. But I think there's still a long way to go. Great. Okay. Well, um, we have run over. Uh, I, I think that's probably fine, uh, given the quality of the presentations today. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters uh, for sharing their knowledge and expertise on this subject um, and uh, just showing on the screen uh, is a slide with everyone listed as well as our email addresses um, so please uh, if you have follow-up questions that you would like to discuss with us about any of the projects that we've talked about today please uh, you know feel free to reach out to us um, and you know I think this is a, a great uh, example of how how we work well in this community is you know sharing our knowledge and experience uh, to benefit everyone else. So thank you to Nancy and Pat, uh, Susan, Lori, and Whitney for uh, for spending the time to uh, to go over their projects with us today. Really appreciate it. 
Um, and thank you all for attending today. Uh, there is one more um, episode of the PBN LSN TAP webinar community training series this year. Uh, on November 13th, uh, we will be doing a presentation on building a rights-based approach to user data privacy and security. Um, so if you'd like more information about that upcoming webinar on November 13th, please see the lsntap.org website. Um, and finally, uh, Sart, who actually wasn't able to join us today from, uh, from LSNTAP, um, I'm sure is happy to get your feedback on this webinar and you will receive a link. Uh, all attendees will receive a link for a survey. So uh, we definitely would value your feedback on this and other uh, episodes in our series this year. So uh, thank you all for joining and uh, please enjoy the rest of your day.